Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Welcome to the RA Edge podcast. This is Mark Bruno, the managing director of the Wealth Management Group at Informa. And we are incredibly excited to have Ken Stern, the president of Lido Advisors, joining us here today. Ken, we've never had the chance to connect before, but I've admired a lot of the work that you and the Lido team have done over the years. You've been one of the fastest growing, one of the most successful firms in the industry. So thank you very much for stopping by the podcast and looking forward to getting your thoughts here today. Thanks, Mark. I'm looking forward to talking to you and talking to everybody that is is listening and reading. It's just, it's a great time to be talking about wealth management. Yep. Especially, and we've said it more times than I could probably count at this point, um, but we've talked about you know this concept of a bull market for financial advice. And I've said again and again, this really does feel like a once in a lifetime growth opportunity for financial advisors, whether you're looking at market conditions or you're looking at broader demographics. Yeah, you know, I'd make the argument that the need for professional financial advice and the ability to access it has never been better. Um, so looking forward to getting your take on that, whether you agree or disagree. But before we get into the fun stuff, Ken, if you wouldn't mind, yeah, I know a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with you and with Lido for a distance, but just as a very good starting point for the discussion here today, would you please just give a little bit of a brief background on the history, the formation of Lido and some of the areas that you're focused on? Absolutely. And and thank you for that. I am excited to talk about the growth and what I'm calling the golden uh, age of wealth management. So as it relates to Lido, Lido was founded uh, just over 20 years ago by a gentleman named Greg Kushner, who was a CPA that decided he didn't want to continue to do audits. But he had this, he, he had actually worked for a family office and he got to see everything that goes on in a family office from from the good to the not so good. And he thought, I wonder if that can actually apply to the to the actual wealth management space, which wasn't even called wealth management at the time. And about the same time, I was actually working with a broker dealer and slowly started when there was this new concept of fee base and registered investment advisory, I put my flag out and thought that's the direction that I want to go. Met Lido and Greg just just under 10 years ago. And we sat down and we talked actually over a family office conference that they were giving. Uh, I needed CE credits. And we just thought about the world the same. And we thought there's this need for, for more, for more robust guidance, more robust planning, more robust strategy. And if we could do that in a way that is scalable and repetitive and find the best of the best and the brightest to join us in this pursuit, we'd have something special that we thought people were just starting to recognize this isn't really an okay, maybe I need it. This is a must-have partnership in terms of financial guidance, wealth management, and going beyond maybe a transactional relationship that was what, what was before. And here we are now, 10 years later, Lido Advisors, you're right, it's working. It's, uh, we've been growing at a, at a healthy clip. We're in many, many, many states in offices across the United States. So we're just, we think we're just getting started. We think the wave is just forming and we've built this chassis to be able to scale and take advantage of that. I'm glad that you called it a golden age for wealth management, because I think our audience is probably sick of hearing me say it's a uh, once in a lifetime bull market (laughs) for financial (laughs) advice. But I mean, it's hard to ignore. It really is. I mean, mentioned the demographics up front, whether it's the number of boomers retiring every day still, right? Or it's the intergenerational wealth 
transfer, um, regardless of where markets are, right? It's only getting that much more complicated um, to manage your money, right? Um, and to manage your, your family's money in the appropriate transition. So really looking forward to seeing how you think about those shifts. And I think maybe the best place to start is just on your organic growth that you've experienced at Lido. We at wealthmanagement.com are always writing about m and because it's the easiest to see, right? Um, when a firm that you know acquires another firm that you know, it's visible, you can talk about it, and it's interesting to our audience to read about. But organic growth is way more behind the scenes, right? You don't see it, you don't hear about it as much. So we're trying to use our edge in this podcast to help define what really good growth looks like or should look like. Um, so maybe we can start there. Ken, can you tell us a little bit about some of the organic growth you know, rates and success that you've had over the years, but also, and more specifically, what some of the primary contributors have been? Sure. Uh, I'm happy to get into all of those different subjects. And I, I guess the, the visual that I would use is for those of us that are, that are in this space and know it, we know all the stats. We know all the data. We know that there's a wealth effect going on. We know that people are looking for guidance and we know all of that. So now here you are on this fishing boat and your fish finder says there's this huge school of fish that is right under your boat. You've got to execute this flawlessly. You've got to be able to use the right line, the right test, the right bait to make sure that, that you deliver that properly. And and I think a lot about that, quite frankly. And that's why we have grown at the double digit rates that we have. And in fact, I don't see it slowing at all. I only see it accelerating for all those macro factors that you mentioned. A lot of advisors will say, or even clients will think, uh oh, well, what if the bull market ends, literally in the market? Or, or, or what if this changes? Or what if the tax laws change? Or, or, or what if? estate planning and the guise of it changes. That's what we get paid for. We want, we want dynamic. They need our guidance and our advice. And so for Lido, we've built a chassis to have a voice, to have something to say, to have a position on how we invest and to have a position on what we think would happen with estate taxes as an example. And with that, we can then be very, very clear at who our, our target client is, and that's part of the growth secret sauce. Know what you do better and know who's going to need that guidance and support and be very, very careful in targeting that individual. And one of the best ways to start with organic growth is with your existing clientele. And whether you do it just in, in an old fashioned eyeballing and staring and looking at it and mind mapping it and saying, what do my clients have in common? Where do they work? What do they do? Where do they spend their free time? What are their interests? And then figuring out how to duplicate that. You can grow your net very effectively by just looking at your core clientele. Now in the digital age, it gets a lot easier because you can actually get that information super quick and then figure out how to how to very selective, selectively market to that group. But you have to have a voice. You have to know what you do better for that core clientele. And then you got to go tell on yourself, Mark. It's interesting to think about your starting point is, you know, your why, right? Your value prop. If you don't have a very clear, rock solid differentiator, right? It becomes that much harder to speak to anyone, right? Let alone um, your core, your ideal client. And I love the fact that you mentioned you start with your existing clients. Is it fair to assume that that is a primary contributor to your organic growth? You know, the, whether it's getting sort of a, I hate to say larger share of wallets, that sounds really crude, right? But deepening your relationship with existing clients and referrals, is that what you would sort of say is the primary contributor to your organic growth? There's a lot of irons in the fire and that's really important. And what I would share with everyone is, is obviously only take on what you can handle. Mm -hmm. I love, we talk to our clients, obviously about diversification and it's the same with your business model as well. I like to diversify the channels, but yes, the nucleus is your clients mm -hmm. and, and what that core clientele looks like and expanding it from that. Now at Lido, I mean, we have different sales channels, whereas 
we may want to talk specifically about what we think could happen with the markets and interest rates and how to position somebody and look for our core clientele with the strategies that we deployed to that. But conversely, we may want to talk to those clients or prospects that are interested in what may happen to estate taxes and you know when it, when the sunset ends and if they're concerned about that obviously working with a high net worth client that is concerned about estate taxes and where they may evolve to and again with our strategies and our voice those are the kind of people we want to connect with so some of it is from the core clientele and it's super important but if you have like you say the why and we believe we can enhance our clients financial lives by pre-planning life's iterations, that's literally our purpose, then what we can do is then literally look for connectivity with people that are interested in what we have in terms of services and strategies. Yeah, and there's another part to the why too that we talk about on this podcast a lot. Yeah, There are people that just say, why is organic growth so important? Um, and more specifically, scalable, repeatable, right? Consistent organic growth. Um, and obviously the firms that are growing, you know, the fastest and are growing in the most scalable ways are worth the most, right? Um, but they're also able to, you know, attract the best talent, right? People want to go work for firms that are, you know, growing. And we'll get into some of your human capital needs, but there, you know, there are so many sort of different ways that you can drive organic growth today, right? Compared to just three, five, and certainly 10 years ago. Um, so I'm I'm curious when you were talking about you know there's the why and then now there's the how so many different options from a digital perspective so much more than just in your signature saying the best compliment I could receive is a referral um, so I'm curious <laughs> I mean are you doing anything different from a digital perspective are you thinking about or even experimenting with AI and how are you using that to help cast a wider net but also ultimately target the right types of individuals for Lido I. Everybody is going to have a different level as to what they can do and how deeply they get. And clearly, we have to bifurcate our highest and best. Some people should absolutely be spending all their time thinking about development and, and marketing, and others should be managing relationships. And, I, and, and again, this isn't, this isn't a, um, a lecture on practice management, although I think it's a super important topic. What I will say specifically to your question, and it's true, I think we've all done things such as putting your signature stamp, you know, a referral is the greatest gift. And we used to always say, what are the people that you know that could benefit from what we uh, mm -hmm. do? And I, again, I mean, I grew up in, a, in an era that we used to do seminars and we used to do, you know, lunches and dinners. And, you know, we can look back on those fondly or not, but it got us here. Absolutely. So now, <laughs> the question is, is how do we evolve that? So if, if you're such a good educator and you're a really good teacher, well, you've got a much bigger map now. Instead of going and doing it at the local library, at the local center, or what, what used to work, you now, have, you now have an infinite, almost infinite amount of people that if they're interested in what you have to say and you can find a firm to help you build it, then I promise you, you can create an ecosystem of which you can share your message online. You could do it through AI, you could do it through digital means, and you can find those people that are looking for what you have to say. And again, whether it's, whether it's through just webinars or, or whatever your compliance departments allow and how you've positioned it, the world has gotten much bigger and much smaller to your advantage if you do it properly. Yeah, it's uh, amazing really to think about how far AI has come and we've seen more firms that are actively not just talking about it and thinking about how to apply it, but are really using it. And I will say, I will take the transcript from this podcast. I'll drop it into chat GBT and I will tell it, give me a 300 word summary of this podcast interview, right? Uh, which wow. will require some editing, no question, right? But it's 90% of the way there. And I know a lot of advisors who are looking to do that with some of their own, whether it's, you know, write me a LinkedIn post, right? Now it's talking about my latest market commentary, synthesize this webinar transcript, right? Into a 600 word piece. So there's so many different ways that it can be applied, right? 
Um, so I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about it and it's making me think we're going to have to launch an AI edge podcast. <laughs> but to your there. point, I mean, you're creating this ecosystem and it works and there's connectivity and this is how this is, this is scalable uh, in what you're doing. And I would say all of the practices and everybody that we're talking to, you don't need to take the biggest bite, but if you find that you have a voice talking about the market or taxes or, or something, and I would encourage people to be more specific yeah. and actually rifle shoot this as opposed to try and be a generalist. But if you can do that and you, you find through keyword searches and through the right means and through a very targeted way that you can find a voice, they're going to find you and you're going to be able to scale that. Yep, definitely. And I, I appreciate you reinforcing that. It's what is the problem that you solve? And then can people find you when they're actually actively seeking a solution, right? So it's getting, the world is getting larger and it's getting smaller, as you say, right? I'll steal that and I'll keep <laughs> using that on this podcast too. Um, I do want to, sticking with the subject of growth though, there's obviously, there are a number of different ways that you can grow. We'll put market appreciation to the side here because we tend to focus on organic growth and then on the inorganic side there's obviously been a lot of m a um there's obviously been a lot of recruiting right and there are different ways that we keep hearing about aqua hires like that's the new buzzword right in the raa space i'm curious you know lido has been pretty active over the years um, whether it's doing acquisitions or you know recruiting teams and advisors i'm curious what is your view just of the the role of m a right in the future growth of RAs, and then more specifically, what role might it play for Lido? Oh, that's a lot to unpack. Okay. <laughs> so, so I first would even take just a half a step to the side and say, one of the hardest things for a growing RAA is finding incredible talent. And, and I think part of that is because there, there, there is a shortage of talent. There's a there's, there's a lot of people that want really talented uh, advisors. So I love tackling the supply side, whether that's going to the colleges, whether that's having an intern program, growing up advisors is really important to us because I don't think that where we're growing, we're going to be able to tackle it all with everything that we want by just by just growing organically, as well as m a or the aqua hires. Now, the aqua hires, it's super interesting and it's really important. <laughs> I think that we've built a chassis for the right individuals to come over and you mentioned it earlier and I'll come back. I mean, we've built this chassis and we need people to drive the car and we've been very thoughtful about what we want, which is an end-to-end -end solution for our clients. So to be able to have everything from trust services to in-house investment management, active management, estate and tax. That's really been an important part of, of Lido's story. So those that want that, I want those individuals that can take that to the next level, whether that's utilizing some of our marketing strategies and grafting off of that, whether it's being able to increase their cash flow because they don't have to focus on the back office and they do have the client first mindset. Uh, the client first mindset with growth is the Lido way. And so when, when we think about aqua hires, what I just basically talked about was culture. And mm -hmm. not everybody has that culture. And that's okay. Some people want to do it a different way. And that's wonderful. That makes a market. There's obviously more than one road to Rome. So that's that that's the type of individual that we're looking to affiliate with if they can embrace and say we want that culture we want one brand we want all of that and that's the that's those that we have found and and to your point it's i think a very important part of growth and i don't want to sidestep that question but i'm not going to affiliate with people that don't fit that culture because mm -hmm. I, I don't think that mashup works. That's, this isn't um, everybody do their own thing. We're almost um, maniacal about making sure that our message is consistent and our process is consistent because that's what our clients expect. And that's how you get rating fans. 
Yeah, it's important. I think uh, when you're looking at some of the opportunities uh, you know, out there, I'm sure you've had the chance to look at a number of different firms and a number of different teams, um, and no one is requiring you right, to do M&A. Um, so I think it's important that our audience takes that note you know, from you is that you can and should be really selective. Um, and culture isn't just about, all right, let's have a pizza party on Friday. Um, it's really about, do we have the same goals? Do we have the same objectives? And do we wake up, get out of bed and want to accomplish the same things, either as a firm, as a team or for our clients, or ideally all of the above, right? So you know, typically when we talk about M&A here, we don't get into how important it is to be selective. So I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's a very, it's probably the most you know, important ingredient for you know, creating a successful deal. Um, and we don't come back to talk about things after the close too, right? So I actually would like to ask you that. I mean, having done some acquisitions and some recruiting, um, is there anything that you would say as you look back on you know, your most successful inorganic growth, growth efforts, what would be the defining characteristics? And also I would say, how do you know it's working? Yeah, that's um, that's actually the best question is to do a post mortem and what worked and, and what didn't. And you evolve and you learn every time. But at the same time, it's like what we say about a family office. Once you see a family office, you've seen a family office. Yeah. Everyone is different. And so for us, I have to go back to, I'll even start with what we missed. We were so, and there's a lot of money, as you know, chasing this space now. A lot of people have gotten really excited about it for many reasons, because it's, you know, such a, uh, um, it, there's so many, I, as you know, value drivers for, for this and why there's consolidation and M&A and private equities involved and, and happy to go into more detail. But at the end of the day, we focus so much on the financials and I would encourage everybody, if, if it works, put the numbers aside, put the pencil down and really get to know the people that you're going to work with and make sure that you have a shared ideology and a shared vision because all the other aspects and the tweaks and the nits can work themselves out. But if you don't have a shared vision, it's gonna be problematic at best. And so to answer your question, our best deals are ones that this was a complete alignment on our vision and how we were going to get there. And I would say the most challenging ones were where we didn't spend enough time on that. Yeah, And, and just to maybe sort of end on the subject of M&A too, because it is one of the most talked about you know, topics in our industry. Um, we've seen a little bit of a slowdown in M&A activity. Um, which is not a surprise. And also when you tend to look at things on a quarter to quarter or even annual basis, um, you're always going to see ups and downs. But I, it, it still feels like there's a healthy M&A environment out there. It still feels like valuations are you know solid um, and that there are high quality firms that are looking to do M&A. At a very macro level, how would you sort of rate you know, some of the opportunities that are out there for M&A right now? And more specifically, knowing that our listeners could be at firms that are not, you know, professional buyers, right? How, what guidance would you give them if they're exploring some of the potential opportunities to partner or even be acquired right now? Oh gosh, I think that the opportunities are going to continue. And I do think that, that valuations and multiples stay high. And I think if there's, and I think you were alluding to, maybe this is just a hiccup or something temporary. I mean, you can't deny that the cost of capital has gone up. And because there was such a fever of, of activity over the last two years, uh, I think that people are just hitting pause, taking stock, being more cautious. I think that you might see more mergers happen as opposed to just pure M&A. Yeah. But what I would really, at least in the short term, but what I would really, to answer your question specifically, encourage those that are, that are looking for potentially partnering is to take a step back and do your mind map and say, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Are you looking for a succession plan? Are you looking for an enhanced journey for your clients? What are your needs? How do you get there? Are you looking to be doing something that you're not doing now? Are you trying to grow the firm or do you want to hand that to those that, that already have a, a plan and a, and a process in place? And what you're going to do once you start 
creating that that list is you're going to find there are different options. You know, there are those that are going to let you do what you do and do it the way you want to do. And they're providing some service, maybe a back office or a synergistic framework. There are those that are going to say, hey, here's our process. Do you buy into that? And then there are those that are, maybe are somewhere in the middle that are going to say, you have these incredible skill sets or talents or idiosyncratic value to us that if we can combine, maybe there's even more value for both of us. Let's see how that works. So I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to be vague in it, but I really think there's three paths and finding the right path for you is, I think, a great exercise. There's a lot of opportunity right now, and there's a lot of really good players in the marketplace that I think can enhance those that are looking to add value and grow to their lives. I couldn't agree more. And that's why we do this podcast, because I think there are more options than ever before, not just for making acquisitions, not just for you know, merging or being acquired, but minority investments, right? We talk a lot about you know recruiting and some other you know, types of ways that your firms can expand and grow. Um, so you can, I appreciate you taking as much time as you did just to walk through some of those options, but more importantly, for putting them in context um, and for really thinking about if I'm going to start a journey, no matter what direction it is, what are some of the key questions that I really should be asking myself and a potential partner? So Ken, thank you so much for laying that out as neatly as you did. It makes my job really easy. You may not even <laughs> right. need me. Maybe we can get ChatGPT to host our edge at some point if we have guests <laughs> like you on. I doubt that. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much, Ken. I feel like this was a great you know, uh, discussion here. I almost feel like it's just a getting to know you and we're going to have to have you back because there's so much more that we could learn from you and talk about on the organic growth side. We could really dig into some business development, some marketing strategies, you know, where you've seen success with referrals and also obviously your view on the M&A space. Um, so thank you for what I'll consider to be the first conversation of many over time. And we really do appreciate you stopping by the RA Edge podcast, Ken. That sounds great. I'm a big fan and I'm looking forward to the first of many as well. Again, Ken Stern, Lido Advisors, thank you very much for stopping here today. We appreciate it. We learned a lot about you know, how Lido has driven a lot of their growth and success and over the, the years and where there should be more continued growth and success for the firm and how you can learn from Ken and his team. So Ken, again, thank you for stopping by the podcast. Thank you to everybody for tuning in today. And we look forward to having you all back on the very next episode of the RIA Edge podcast. Take care, everyone. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RAI benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business, and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RAI benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.